right, all right, all right. Good evening, guys. Everybody have a nice, long, and productive day here. I've learned a lot. I don't understand most of it, but I've learned a lot, I guess. <laughs> so welcome once again to Evolve 2016 here in Orlando. Uh, I know everybody's excited about Harry Potter tonight and everything like that. So let's end today off with a good end cap. And here to do that for you is Mike Bluestein, and he's going to be talking to you guys about Coco Sharp in Xamarin Forms. So, Mike, why don't you take it away? Thanks. Thanks for coming, everybody. So, yeah, um, looks like a good number of people. Hope everyone's had a good day. So, I'm going to talk about Coco Sharp in Xamarin Forms today, as I just said. Um, talk a little more about Coco Sharp in the Xamarin Forms part. I'm going to assume that most people know Xamarin Forms, but I will show you how to integrate it and hook things together. And uh, you know, hopefully be interesting to folks and get people started. So first thing you might ask is, and some, I was talking to some folks before, before the session started, is like, why would I even use Coke? It, it seems like totally orthogonal technologies, right? You have a game technology and this thing for you know, cross-platform application development that kind of go against each other. Why would you use one and the other? So there's a couple of use cases depending on what you're building. So if you're building games, which is you know, what people would be doing up to now um, with Coco Sharp, it's, it's a game engine. You, know, you have, in games, commonly, there are still user interface type of things, such as you know, your level editor, your, your um, sort of level selection screens in between as you're moving between levels, or setting screens, that sort of stuff. And doing user interface with gaming technologies yeah, it can be done in a cross-platform way, but it tends to be a little bit cumbersome, regardless of the platform, historically, across different gaming engines. Certainly in Coco Sharp, they have things like menus and CC menu and CC menu item. It's not the it works fine, um, but it's not, a use, it's not designed for like, application development, event-driven, interactive type things. It's a gaming engine. So bringing something like Xamarin Forms to the table for somebody making games makes something like that really easy to do, because now I have cross-platform UI I can do. And so my, you know, my in-between levels of this inter interstitial screens or setting screens I can do with a technology that is a UI technology, which is really nice. So there's that use case. And I think that's a key. You know, that's probably a, the bigger use case, arguably so. So it lets you build these kind of level screens, or like basically transition to another screen um, without having to go straight into the Coco Sharp technology. You can do that in Xamarin Forms. Right. Additionally, if anyone's done Coco Sharp before, the, Coco, the core of Coco Sharp is all cross-platform, but there was a little bit of bootstrapping code that you'd have to write, and you still would if you were doing the, an uh, iOS app you know, with Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android, and then you just want to have all this like core shared game code. There's a little bit of code you'd have to do that's platform specific on each platform you're going to, whether you're going on, you know, where it was still supports to Windows Phone or Android or on iOS. Not a lot of code, not hard code, but still it's there. So now this setup code, which you still have to do, um, gets abstracted a little bit from you and can be done completely in the, the Xamarin Forms part. So even your setup code, your bootstrapping code, as I've termed it in the past and still do, um, can all be cross-platform. So now you're 100% cross-platform, and that's nice. So in games, you have a, a couple, couple key use cases where bringing Xamarin Forms into Coco Sharp together uh, without even doing, with, with, without even having getting into the application side of things, you have, a, have some benefits. And now the other side of things, which is not the way a lot of people think about Coco Sharp, is using it in apps. And this isn't necessarily just for, for Xamarin Forms, even though the talk today talks about using it with Xamarin Forms. This just applies to any kind of application where I might want to use Coco Sharp for its, graph, for its visualization capabilities. Right? So if I wanted to take advantage of the different w visual things you can do in Coco Sharp at a really high level, and it does a lot for you, things like effects, particle systems, declarative actions, which we'll talk about throughout the talk, variety of things you could take advantage of that have nothing to do with the game right? and use used nicely, they, they can maybe offer some things within, within an application as well. Think like dynamic charting, you know, if you don't want to go to a charting component, or just maybe like kind of just a little bit of, um, a little bit of pizzazz to the app, right? Additionally, there's layouts. Um, now, I know Xamarin Forms, you know, has its layout system, and it's, it's a pretty classic, you know, two-pass layout system, and you can do, there's even a talk here I saw at the conference that, do, that shows how to do custom layouts, but another alternative is you could use something like Coco Sharp to do interesting layouts. This is a simple one I'm going to show you later with a circle. But what's kind of cool about it is by doing a custom layout with, with Coco Sharp, you could then take advantage of the rest of Coco Sharp, the things like I mentioned before, particles and, and effects, and kind of blend the other capabilities of Coco Sharp with the layout so that layouts can say, do things like animating the layout, 
right? Things which you might do in certain native technologies, one near and dear to my heart in iOS is UI collection view. And UI collection view is how you would do something like a circle like this and animate it and doing interesting things to make this layout interactive and move around. Um, that would be a hard thing to do, even with a custom layout in Xamarin Forms. And then to, the amount you would do dipping down into the native code would kind of defeat the benefit of some of Xamarin Forms. So th this is another, you know, doing the UI collection view type of thing. If folks aren't familiar with that, you can go look on Xamarin's docs. There's a lot about UI collection view there. But in a cross-platform way, not just for iOS. That's where, it's, that's where it, could be it could be compelling, right? So, with that, a little setup about why you, you know, the kind of the, the, the reasons you might want to do it. How do you even get started, right, before we start talking about the API? How do I get Cocoa Sharp? What is it? What is Cocoa Sharp? Do I have to build from source? Or like, what do I get to do to get a component? Well, it's, it's really easy. They made it really easy now. It wasn't a, it used to be a little more energy, but now it's really clean. It's available in NuGet. That's been that way for a while, but it's just, there's Cocoa Sharp dependency, so you can take that one down. And that's if you were just using classic Xamarin iOS, Xamarin Android, you can just bring in Cocoa Sharp. If you want the forms piece, you get the additional Cocoa Sharp for Xamarin Forms. And that brings a higher level thing on top of the already high level thing, Cocoa Sharp, to bring the additional forms pieces, which I'll show you here today. Okay? So those are the two packages you have to bring in from NuGet. NuGet, if you will. Just say it the Miguel way. So along with that, though, if, if you, you know, that's like what you'd probably be doing, you have an existing app. If you either want to start something clean from scratch or you just want to see how to do that, right? you, don't, you want to see what's the PCL profile I want to do out of the 18 different PCL profiles or whatever, um, there's a nice set of project templates you can use just as shows you how to get started with like a very couple simple applications. One's just like a little, they call it a gallery. It's got a few different features to it and another one's an empty project one, which will just give you the bare bones to kind of pull in the dependencies. So you can get that, those project templates if you're using Xamarin Studio in the Xamarin Studio add-in manager, right? It's actually a lot of people, I'm surprised how many people don't even know about the Add-in Manager. There's a variety of other cool things you can get in Xamarin Studio to bring in to extend it. It's kind of neat. And in Visual Studio, it's available as well. You can go up into the Visual Studio gallery, okay? And all the latest uh, uh, project templates are available there. Right, so that's, the, that's it. That's how you, you know, that's the kind of vanilla to like what you got to do to go get the thing, right? Of course, it's open source and you can build from source, but that's how you, it's, it's very low friction to, to try to bring in the dependencies. There's just these two things to use it within Xamarin Forms. So great. You've got Xamarin Forms, you've got Cocoa Sharp, you've got some you know, potential use cases I talked about, but what is Cocoa Sharp? You know, I know folks probably already know it's a game engine. Um, who, who doesn't know what Cocoa Sharp is? Doesn't know. Okay, so folk, most folks know. So what we're going to do here today is I'm going to talk about the Cocoa Sharp API a little bit now, right? Less about Xamarin Forms, like I mentioned. But we'll talk about it with the new API because there was quite a few changes. Um, fu functionally, a lot of things are the same, but there are a few big changes and, and a couple in particular that actually make the whole doing it within Xamarin Forms or within a regular Xamarin app uh, possible. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So take a step back. There's a lot of options if you're doing games, right? Or if you wanted to use a game technology in an application, like, like we're talking about. You have a lot of options with Xamarin. Um, it's kind of like get your head around. R real popular options, mono game, which is what Coco Sharp builds on top of, right? Mono game's open source, been around for a while. Um, a lot of successful games that are written on it. It's an implementation of X, an open source implementation of XNA. Um, and it's, it's pretty great, okay? And Coco Sharp sits on top of mono game under the scenes. Another alternative you have is if you didn't care about cross-platform, kind of like why you go into Xamarin if you didn't at this point, but there's a couple great APIs I'll just mention that Apple has. Um, they're not cross-platform. It's iOS only, iOS, the Apple TV, all, all the Apple platforms, called SpriteKit and SceneKit. SpriteKit's very much inspired by the Cocos 2D implementation, the, the Objective-C one. There's a bunch of different Cocos 2D implementations, Cocos Sharp's one, and it's the C-Sharp one, real nice one. Um, so Sprite Kit's like that for iOS only. Nice thing about that is if, you really, if, you, if you're okay with just targeting iOS, it has a lot of capability that integrates natively with that platform very well. For example, you could take advantage of core image and things that are specific to that flat platform right within, um, right within your game. But it is platform specific. Works fine from C Sharp or F Sharp though, so you could, you know, it's not like you can't use your technology you have here, just like any other native thing from Xamarin. Another um, option you have is Scene Kit. That's a 3D, um, I wouldn't even call it a game engine, but it's a 3D you know, scene graph technology that they kind of position for what they call casual 3D games. And you know, th those both work fine with Xamarin. If you're interested in those, you can take a look at some talks from Last of All by Gabe. Right? Newer 
if you do care about cross-platform, which you, sh you probably should, right? I'm sure you all do. There's this Earl Sharp thing, which is a cross-platform thing that some of the new binding technologies they have for C++ um, is bearing some fruit. And this allows you to do a lot of the type of things. It's really analogous or competitive to SceneKit, except it is cross-platform. And that's really, if you want to do a 3D game, it's, it's pretty compelling. Same thing, you can do some visualization stuff with that, too. That's even, um, you've, you've seen that in some examples Miguel's done over, over the last couple months, too. And then there's what we're talking about today. And there's other things, other smaller players and various different things. Not necessarily smaller, but uh, Coco Sharp. And Coco Sharp is generally a 2D game framework. There are some 3D pieces, but it's, it's, it's what, 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 what typically works well with it is the 2D, and that's what it was really originally designed for. It's cross-platform, it's open source, okay? And it sits on top of mono game. Officially, there's support for the you know, three, three places I have up there on the screen, but it, since it sits on mono game, you technically could get it to go on all the targets of mono game. Um, but I believe the official support right now is still targeting just the mobile platforms, right? Um, if you did want to make it work, it, 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 it's not an impossibility to try to get at least most of it working on other platforms. Because again, it, it does sit on top of mono game. But that, that's what, when we talk cross-platform, what I'm talking about here today. Right? When, you, you, when you're looking at a Coco Sharp app used in an application or a game, there's some core pieces that every single one of these things are going to have. New, which we'll talk about this, is the, this view. Um, there's actually a couple classes around that. And every, you know, you're going to have that. You're going to have scenes. You're going to have layers sprites and actions. Pretty much every Coco Sharp actions, technically you, you wouldn't have to have that, but you'd lose a lot of the benefit and the goodness of the high level abstractions that it gives you if you didn't take advantage of it. So I think you'd probably want to. So I, I, I kind of put those into the category of everybody using Coco Sharp would do those things. But then there's a bunch of other really neat stuff. You know, to do visual effects with particle systems. There's actually effects and their implementation is neat because it's implemented as actions. There's physics engines you can bring in. With it, 2D physics engines, there's an audio system, a bunch of things. Support for uh, uh, texture, um, um, you know, just isometric games, all kinds of things like that. So those are the things that you, you kind of call them, I don't want to say necessarily advanced, but depending on what you're doing, you may or may not use those things. Right? So let's take a look then. Of all, you know, we'll talk about like, what are the core things you can do and then a few other things, and we'll kind of like do a tour of the API and some of the things that you do, broken off into the different sort of functional areas. First thing you'd want to do, you're doing this game, you're doing the game or an app. I got to display things on the screen. Right? Um, how do you do that with Coco Sharp? Well, new in the latest ver the 1.7 you know, um, version of Coco Sharp is this class called the CC Game View. Now, if anyone's done Coco Sharp up before that, there was a, there's, a, there's a class called the CC application and a CC application delegate that goes along with it. Um, very much kind of mimicking the programming model you'd see from iOS in some ways, in a lot of ways. Right? Of course, it was cross-platform still. One key thing about that, though, and the whole architecture and design of it pre the 1.7 version we're talking about today, is that CC application and, and how Coco Sharp worked would take up the entire screen. And it was just the one view, and everything would happen in that one view. So if I wanted to do things like have a piece of the screen be Coco Sharp, and have another piece of the screen just be native application, like we were talking about if you're doing an app. Um, you couldn't do that right, because of the way it worked. So now, this is key. So this CC game view is the thing that allows you to create a view, and it's a native view. Right? It, on, depending on the platform you target, it'll actually inherit from the specific platform specific views, UI view, view, swap team panel. Okay? But you don't, have to, you don't have to be concerned with that as a programmer. You can just deal with CC game view. Right? So you still have cross-platform code. But what's nice is this now allows you to just have, you know, it's going to be treated on iOS like another UI view. So it can be in the view hierarchy. It's going to be treated like another view in Android and so forth. Right? So you get this native view on each platform. But now you can actually do it as a view, and you can have, just like any other view, you can have other things on the screen. And then they can interact with each other, and that's nice. And within that view, the entire Coco Sharp programming model still, still holds. Right? You just do it within a view. Um, pretty neat. It still it does the kind of things like CC, like the CC application and delegate we do. You're setting up the game. The delegate part gets gets um, changed into this event that you handle. This view created event, and you'd handle things in there such as setting up what um, content folders, subclasses you're going to go to for the different device or resolution uh, dependent content you may want to load, creating your first scene, loading the game, and so forth, starting the game and kicking off the game loop or, or app. I say game. I'm, I'm I'm meaning something in a Coco Sharp view, right? So that's all the, the, the biggest change, really, of, to Coco Sharp going into 1.7. And it's what makes the 
the forms part really possible. Just note, though, this is not a forms class. I'm talking about just using it in Xamarin and iOS and Xamarin and Android and Windows Phone and so forth, right? Now, with Xamarin Forms, though, they have this class called the Coco Sharp View. And what Coco Sharp View does is it, via a renderer, custom renderers, it actually gets you to, those, to, the, to the CC, you know, to the class we were just talking about, right? But the beauty of this thing is now this is just another Xamarin Forms view. So now you're not in the platform specific class like the CC game view is doing. Of course, at the end of the day, Forms all abstracts platform specific things anyway, but you don't see it as a programmer. You're in this Coco Sharp view, which can be another view that can be set to content, put in a page, and treated like any other you know, view that goes inside of a Xamarin Forms application, right? Um, there's one caveat, one, one limitation. You can, the way it is today, you can only have one of these, whether you're in the, doing with a classic Xamarin type of app or the Forms one, you can only have one of these guys, the CC game view or this Coco Sharp view on the screen. Okay, so you can't have two on the screen at once. That's today, that's the way it works. Okay, so that's a limitation. But other than that, you can treat it like another view and you can put it, and you'll see in the example how it, it, it works just like anything else. And then within the Coco Sharp game view, you do the Coco Sharp things, right, which aren't specific to anything. It's just regular old Coco Sharp, right? So you have this view, um, whether, you, whether you deal the, with the native one directly, that would, if you're doing a classic app or if you're doing forms like we're talking about, you have an event that you handle that does a little bit of setup code and it loads up what you first see in that view, which we'd call your game. And even if you're, if you're gonna do a full screen game, you would just like render it to the full screen. If you want to do it as a part, you can just have it, you know, be part of, the, part of the screen and have other things from the native application or the forms application, okay? Here's the simple, kind of the simplest code for setting up a Coco Sharp view. And you can see I have a page there, and you know, just a Xamarin Forms page. I just initialize an instance of the thing, and I set it to content. Okay, so it's just another thing. You can only have one. I'm doing it in code. Now I will note that um, I'll just say it, just, just to not like, be sneaky. I tried to get it working in XAML. I wasn't so successful about getting the getting the thing to work with XAML. I don't think if, I think I'm, I'm going to talk to one of the fellows that work the guy that works on it. Um, I think that might be my failing. I, I think it actually would. I might be doing something wrong. Um, but we'll see about that. So, but certainly you can do it in code. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so I've got this Coco Sharp view, and the view is what's going to manage presenting, you know, the kind of your design space onto the screen, right? It's kind of the, the container for which all the Coco Sharp part goes within. You can have all Xamarin form stuff on the outside. They can interact, as I said, and so forth. Now, within Coco Sharp, though, now, now, you get, now you're jump, jumping, jumping down into Coco Sharp closer to the way it had always been, even before the 1.7, a little bit. You have this thing called a scene. And what a scene really represents, well, before 1.7, it represented a screen, right? Now, because you can have views, it may or may not be a screen, but it's one presentation within the game view. And this is managing the loading of the game layer, which we're about to talk about in a minute. And it manages running the game and transitioning between screens, okay? There's another class called a director that you could use to load up different different scenes. So you can think like a, almost like a movie kind of paradigm where you just have like a director says, you know, I go to one scene and I load, run the game and run the game with this scene, or run the view with this scene, right? And then I load the next scene. The scene itself isn't presenting anything, it's just kind of managing that overall transition to a particular screen or a particular view space. Now, within the scene, right, well there's the code where I run it and I run the scene, I add a layer. Now what a layer is, this is the outer container that's actually managing all the visuals, your, 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 your basically your, your graph, right, of all the nodes that go within the view itself. So you have, to take a step back, this view, setting things up, setting up the game, running the game, loading the first scene, the scene adding the first layer, right? Scenes being things that if you had multiple screens where you can, man you can manage transitions between the multiple screens, the thing that actually gets presented being the layer. In a simpler app or game, you may just have one layer, you could have multiple, right? And within the layer, that's where you build up your scene graph, right? Your node hierarchy, if you will. And this is within the layer where you're gonna add things like the nodes, the node being the base class of everything that represents a position on the screen and, and um, something that can have actions uh, as associated to it. We'll talk about actions a little bit later. Right? Within here, though, you can put your particle system, your sprites, you, you know, put effects on those. Everything's going to go within the CC layer, right? and it's added to the scene. Also within the CC layer, you can do a lot of things um, very declaratively, but there are some times you want to do something right within the game loop or in some kind of a scheduled, you know, some kind of a scheduled code that's running on some, some time slice. And that's, there's a scheduled method you could do to run your custom code. Some people do this to do things like do a collision check, 
run some kind of game logic. Kind of the things that you do more classic code you might do in an engine that's a little bit lower level, like if you were dumping right into mono game itself, right, where they have render and update that you'd override. Right, so you can schedule things and do your own custom code in a repeated interval. So there's that. So this is, this, this is how you'd add a layer. It's just a simple one line code. You create your layer, you add it to the scene. Okay? That's kind of your setup code. Beauty of doing it with Xamarin Forms is that code now, that's kind of that setup code I mentioned that would happen in that event that used to be in a delegate that would be in platform specific parts. So now it happens in this one event that can kind of, that can all live within the PCL. And all you end up having in your, um, your native applications is just the, your content, because right, you have to have the content that gets packaged with it, and the thing that bootstraps Xamarin Forms, right? The init call where they bootstrap it. So it becomes 99.8% cross platforms. So it's kind of cool. So now the visuals that you create on the screen, well, there's different kinds, but the most common thing you'll work with is this sprite class. And what a sprite is, it's a node, right? So a node is the thing that gives you a position in space in your world space. The sprite app really actually is what represents the texture underneath the covers that you're showing in you know, the image, the uncompressed image that gets rendered up through the GPU, that the GPU deals with uncompressed data. So it's a high level abstraction around it, your texture and textures that can be moved independently so you can animate or move them independently. Right? So that's what a sprite is, abstracting a texture. To deal with a sprite, um, one thing you'll, you'll, you'll run into, because especially with all the, even with one platform, let alone multiple platforms, you can have all these different resolutions. So to, in, in an effort, one of, the way, one of the things you can do in an effort to have you know, content that would get loaded that handles you know, the proper content for different resolu rev resolutions, devices, um, without having the, the physical size of those, Sprites change or those images change on the screen, you can, you can set this default pixel to content ratio. Um, and what that does is that maintains the size of content across different resolution devices. So you can have a higher resolution device, you can have higher resolution content and have it be the same physical size to the user running your game or application, okay? And this is, the, again, more setup code that you might, you would do within that event where things get loaded that replaces the old, the old CC application delegate. And I'm just saying, like, you know, depending on, you can have whatever logic you want. In this case, it's just saying, this is what you would get out of the simple project template to get started. Depending on, you know, what, whether I'm on what I'd consider a higher resolution or a lower resolution device, I'll load the appropriate content by adding the proper folder. All the folder goes under content, and then you add it as a subfolder in there. And then depending on which one I load, I set the proper, you know, that proper ratio so that things stay the same physical size. So if it's a double, you know, if it's twice the resolution of an image that I'm going to be loading in there, I'd set that ratio so it would maintain the same physical size as the smaller one. But, you know, it would be crisper, but, you know, be, it looked this, the game would look the same. It wouldn't be bigger or smaller, depending on how you do it. And you can add more, you can have more, you know, more logic to this if you, have, you want to deal with things more granularly and have more content that's more, not just high definition, low definition. You might want a lot more the way things are these days. Okay? Another thing to work with with sprites that this thing supports, that this is just the, the very common stuff that you'd expect, is sprite sheets. Um, texture atlases, other platforms may call them as well. And what this does is this groups images into a single file. And the reason you'd want to do that is it offers a variety of different performance benefits, the biggest of which being it reduces the I.O. Imagine if you have a lot of images that you're loading into sprites, you'd have to go back and forth to all these files. This way you just load up one. The second thing that it does is it packs down because you pack all the images, you can kill all the dead space, so you can actually re not only reduce all the I.O., you know, minimize the I.O. cost, but you can reduce the amount of um, actual size you take up in the image because you can pack it pretty tight depending on what kind of tooling, or, you know, what application you use to actually create your sprite sheet. One that I'll mention that a, a lot of folks use, that, that I actually use, is um, um, Texture Packer. It has a free version and has an open uh, um, a commercial version that you can pay for with a, a, a little bit of better algorithm to pack things a little tighter if you wanted to do that. There's a doc up on that on the Xamarin site as well if you wanted to look at it. Right. And generally improving performance. To work with um, the sprite sheet, you go through the CC sprite sheet class. And the tools would dump out you know, a plist, which is just an XML file defining where all the images are, and then some metadata about which image and which file they originally came from. Once you have that, what's kind of neat with Cocoa Sharp and C Sharp is you can then use Link to, to interrogate you know, the data from that sprite sheet and then just get frames out of it, which you can load up a sprite from. You know? So it's like I, I just load up this one image, and then I can just find whatever I want within there. Like in this case, I'm just finding the cloud, because when I packed the thing, it originally had an image called cloud, okay? And again, it's a uh, texture packer is the tool you probably, did. there's a few, but th that's the one I use, and it's pretty good, and it's, it's a free version, um, or it has a free level. So we talked about how to load up, you know, how to get Coco Sharp into Xamarin Forms. We talked about how you would actually get things on the screen, right? The basics of how you'd initialize the game, do some setup in a cross-platform way, and get sprites on the screen, both individually or from 
you know, if, if they're put into sprite sheets. And that's good. But at that point, everything's still static, right? Nothing's moving. So how do you move things on the screen with Coco Sharp? I think this is one of the two key things that this and other game engines like it really bring. A high-level declarative way to take actions on nodes, in particular sprites, but any kind of node, particle systems, what, what, what have you. CC action, it's an action performs a task on nodes. Uh, a task on a node could be commonly, the common thing you think of is animating the sprite. So I can, with the scheduler and the going through the game loop, I can manually just figure out the vector and the time step that went through and move things custom, with custom code, um, every iteration through the game loop. And that would work fine. And that's the kind of thing you do if you're implementing an action, and you can implement custom actions under the covers um, directly. But you can do it with actions. You can achieve, like, move to here, move by this, jump to here, jump by this, that sort of thing. You can just say do it, and the rendering just happens for you. And it's very de that's what I mean by declarative. You just tell it what to do. You don't actually write the animation code. You just take this class, and you say apply it to some node, add it to a node, and it just happens. Right? Um, it's great. Very impressive uh, what you can do with just a few lines of code with these things. And there's more about actions and how they work with the, how effects work with this kind of pro with the same programming model in classes that we'll talk about a little bit later. You can run multiple actions. There's an action that encapsulates other actions called CC sequence, and you can run in serially one after another. Right? So you can have a bunch of actions, put them into the CC sequence, then take that one action and apply it to a whole bunch of different sprites. You don't have to create ten actions for ten sprites. You can just have the one that gets reapplied. Likewise, you can do, there's another one called CC Spawn. I and mean, there's a whole bunch of them. I'm just kidding, hitting some of the simpler, higher level ones. Here we have the sample game I wrote a long time ago called Gone Bananas. Um, what that's doing is it's using CC Spawn to manage the banana falling um, with a move to action and rotates it while it falls. Right? In a real game, you might want to drop the thing with physics. By the way, that game uses physics to drop the balls. There's some other examples that are a little fresher than that one now, but just mentioning it. So, you know, these are the kind of things you could do. So you might think, okay, that's great, that's games. Like, what would I do in, in apps? Well, you know, you can imagine animating charts or having live graphics where some data is coming in and coming in as Xamarin Forms app and the charts changing live and animating and moving. Maybe, you know, if it was a stock and it was Apple and you'd see it ticking down the last two Anyway, <laughs> so another way, so I mentioned two ways. I showed you actions and I showed, um, um, I talked about doing it manually because obviously you can always animate or do anything manually on the game loop. There's also um, physics engines, and what the physics engines do, they animate things. They animate, they create a physics world, and you animate something in, a, in the physics world with a, uh, with a physics body, and then what you do is you associate the sprite to that physics body, and then the thing animates with that, and it looks like it's actually animating the sprite, like you see here with the thing on the rope swinging back and forth. So there's one, if you look in the Coco Sharp repo, there's this uh, 2D um, physics engine that's very popular called Box2D. People probably heard of it. There's a, it was written in C++. There's a C-sharp port of that. Very much a line, almost a line-by-line line port. You'll see it's not... A, one thing about Coco Sharp that I really like is it's... We use the term idiomatic. It, it looks like it's designed for a C-sharp developer. It is. But the APIs, for the most part, you know, there's things here and there, but for the most part, feel C-sharp. You know, there's some naming and some things that have some legacy that come along with it. But you'll feel at home with it generally, you know? It, it'll say that. The box 2D thing, you kind of won't. Almost feels like you're writing. You, it's a C++ API, but it's not. Box 2D is a pretty good C++ API. C++ APIs go. So you'll see the naming, you'll see the style, the, you know, the case. Just everything about it doesn't feel as C sharp. But it's the good thing is it's actually pretty easy to work with. So that's available to you. And there's a whole bunch of tests. We'll talk about tests later. You create with box 2D. There's a physics world, a physics body. A physics shape, like, we, like I talked about that, with how you move the physics shape and body around in the world and a fixture, how you tie things together. And there's some good examples up in there. There's also, an, now you can bring other physics engines to it, though. And if you have your own you know, C-sharp engine, you could, you could make it work in here. Um, there's another one I know of that I've used a little bit, not as much as I've used the Box2D one, called Chipmunk Sharp. I haven't touched it in a while, so I'm a little, I'm almost a little hesitant to bring it up, but I know it's available and it's just another um, um, port of another popular physics engine that's available to you if you wanted to check it out, okay? So that's the kind of ways to, so we can add things to the screen, we can set, set things up, add things to the screen. We talked about how we can move things around through animation. So that's great. You can do a lot with that now, right? You, you could, you could you know, be great. You know, now you just like, you know, start, boy, I could, I could animate things, I can add things to the screen, it's like efficient, and I get, I get a whole bunch of these actions that I can, you know, declaratively do things that I don't even have to write the code for. I just say move to that point and things move to me. It's like a command. Sweet. 
So you also want to be able to interact. You know, the user's going to be able to have to interact with the application, obviously. Um, they have APIs for doing this in Cocoa Sharp. One, and this has actually changed a little bit, and I, I feel like it got a little bit nicer. Um, you create a touch listener. You set the touch list, you, you set a handler method on the listener. It's a little different than you might, you know, you say, oh, what's, that's not idiomatic. I don't see events. And you, you kind of be right, but um, I think there's some performance benefits to doing it this way, if I'm not mistaken. But, and then you add the listener, right? Create the touch listener, set a handler method on it, add the listener. And then you get touch events. Right? And I say events, it's just a method that you handle. They have a very similar, I didn't put it in the slides, there's a similar type of API to handle uh, accelerometer input as well. So you can do that. And there's good tests to show either one. So this is how you can handle touch interaction. I have it in an example later we can, we can talk about. And again, you know, there's also the other kind of device interactions like accelerometer that's, at least I know accelerometer is available. So cool. We can set up, we can add things to the screen, we can animate, and we can interact, at least for touch. You've got kind of the common things you'd want to do. And universal touch handling, so it's like, you know, and if you want, if you're in forms, you can just do the touch handling that you have from that and just like, you know, dispatch the calls into the Cocoa Sharp part if you wanted to handle it that way. Nothing, I didn't do that, but that, that's another alternative if you're mixing the things together, okay? Next thing you have I'm gonna talk about is something that's really interesting. They have a drawing API in here. Now, I know there's these other, anyone heard of Ski -a Sharp, the thing they've been talking about? There's a 2D drawing API that's really rich and um, this isn't, quite as rich as that. I think in the future that might be something that could potentially be used underneath this API to add some more features. That said though, this is still got a, this is higher level and easier to work with and it's got quite a bit of capability. It's not, a, it's not got, it doesn't have everything you'd see in system drawing or everything you see in core graphics or Skia. It's got quite a bit. And it's, it, like everything else in Cocoa Sharp, it's higher level. So you deal with drawing in the, at the node level. It's just another node that you add to the screen. Within that node you draw. Right? And there's all kinds of things you can draw, lines and polygons and circles. Just recently, there was a pretty good um, article that was published on the Xamarin site, so you can check that out. Very recipe-driven, which just shows how to do all the different things. And then there's the tests that I'll show you that you can do here. So those are the kind of things you can draw, polygons, polylines, bezies, which are expensive. Um, but you can do that. Here's a simple example drawing a polygon. So you can see, you just you, you create a draw node. That's your node. That's, your, that, that's another thing that just gets added to your, you know, your scene graph, right? your node hierarchy. I'll call it a scene graph. And then you draw on that thing. And you draw with a variety, you just issue drawing commands, right? Much higher level than other drawing APIs. So that's nice. Um, you might run into like, well, how do I like, you know, change the curve, you know, change the, the pattern that I draw the outer, you know, the outer border. And, and depending on what you're drawing, you may or may not be able to do that. And that's where I think I made that comment about ski that maybe there could be some potentially some work done in the future. But even without that, you can do quite a bit with this. Now, other thing that's really neat about drawing though in here, and you know, other APIs have it, but what, it's, it works really well in here, it, it, given that it, it, the whole thing works within the high level nature of the scene graph is there's this CC render texture. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to draw the texture to memory. So I can do procedural, I can write code that draws. Right? So I could create a dynamic graphic, render the whole thing into memory, and then just take the texture out of that and assign that texture to, this, to a sprite and then just add the sprite and do things like any other, just like I did with any other sprite that I'd have, like my monkey or the banana or anything else that you'd have on the screen. And then I can animate that sprite with the high-level actions. So I get this really trivial, you know, simple API for dealing with sprites and actions, but I can do you know, semi-complex drawing that's at least proceed procedurally and dynamically and do things like there's an article on, I'll keep referring to the Xamarin site because they've got some good docs. This article I'll, I'll, I'll mention to you isn't, doesn't, isn't written for 1.7, so beware of that. But just the same, it's worth taking a look at. And I think it could be upgraded to the newer API without too much trouble. But one f there's an article up there that talks about how you would do, anyone ever play Tiny Wings? I Tiny Wings is a game where the little bird flies around and he's, there's these hills in it. And the hills just scroll side to side, but so there's a, you know, a curve, looks like a bear's yee, and it gets drawn. And then the graphics that get filled in, the texture are dynamic, they're always changing. So every time you play the game, it always changes. That's the kind of thing you could do. So there's an article that shows you exactly how to do that. And I was thinking, like, you know, I, I didn't do it for this talk, but I thought about it. But it would be interesting to have, like, that, what if I had a curve and that curve was actually representing some data? And I draw the Bezier through points that are coming from some data and I could procedurally fill in graphics. I could have something that's talking to a stock ticker and I could have a live stream of a stock price or a trading desk on the phone, that kind of stuff. A live, any kind of live data stream. Um, and that would be the same thing as, like, what a Tiny Wings is, is doing. 
And so you could do something like that within an app. Certainly you could do it within a, in a game. So, and then in the example here, you can see I just drew a little thing, but that was just a little touch example where you can draw on the screen and the, the thing is added to the screen through a sprite, but it gets added to, a, to, a, to the screen through a sprite via a texture that's drawn in memory through CC render texture, um, creating dynamic graphics. So that's cool, the, the dynamic graphics piece. It's, it's a little more advanced. It takes a little bit more code than the other parts of it, um, which is why I didn't try to put it into a slide. But there's a bunch of examples of that available via tests. I, some call the tests, I call them nice samples. Um, along with that, though, picked up the term fancy visuals. Um, some of this might be appropriate and only in games, maybe not, but you know, it's there, you can come up with what you want. There's particle systems, as you'd expect, within any kind of gaming API, right? Graf graphical effects, the kind of things that if you were dropping down in a lower level code, you'd do with, you would do with maybe shaders, it's a lot more code, believe me. Um, it's pretty easy to do. In here, there's just another node. There's a whole bunch of stock particles out of the box. Like here I have the sun one, the smoke, rain, you name it. And then you can customize them. They each have a lot of properties on them. And there's a whole bunch of examples you can, you can, um, um, you can take advantage of to see how to work with these things. You add them into, onto the screen just like adding another node. So you, I add that very much like I'd add an, another um, um, sprite. You have to be a little bit careful because they're more expensive. So if you had too many of them, it could get a little performance intensive. So you'd want to manage, like, you know, you'd want to manage them effectively, be it the number of particles, be it not having too many on the screen at once, removing them appropriately when they don't need to be there. But you could also add custom particles. So there's the sun example there. You can see it's just creating another node. In this case, it's a particle system specific to the type I'm showing the sun and setting some properties on it. They're all like that. So it's really easy to work with. Now, that said, though, if, if none of the ones that are out there and there's a whole bunch float your boat, even though you can, there's a bunch of out of the box and you can customize them, sometimes people want to get really fancy with these particle systems, there's good tools that exist. This is um, one called Particle Designer. It's not free, but I use it. But there's other, other ones. You can, you can Google, you can find things. This is the one I, I like, this one. It works for a lot of other, it works for a variety of different game engines. Um, and what this thing does is it allows you to design your particle system within it, and then it dumps out a plist. It, it's just a it's just a XML file, right? Uh, that's that's basically encapsulated the entire particle system in this one file. It's kind of big, but it could compress down. And you could use it cross-platform. You load it up in the API through the CC particle system quad class, right? And that and then you just treat it like any other particle system. So you can have a custom particle system, and it would all work cross-platform. So it's kind of sweet. Um, so you know. The nice thing about this tool is also the guy's got a, a library of users that share, they socialize the particle systems they've made. So there's a whole bunch of out of the box that you can like, grab out of there too and just bring them in and then you can customize them. And then there's other, there's a, if that, if you want, there's a variety of other ones too. There's, you can, I'm, I'm talking about this one. I don't have any interest in it or anything. I just like it. But there's some other free ones. Apple has a particle designer built right into Xcode. I'm not sure if that would, if, if you'd be able to export that out of Xcode straight into a, um, Coco Sharp. It'd be worth trying, though, because that, that one, of course, wouldn't cost anything, and that's actually pretty good, too. I don't think it's as good as the, the one I just showed you, though. So there's, like, great support for particle systems. Now, in addition, though, there's, there's other things. Like, this is now, we're into things that are really kind of specific to games. I don't know, you know, particle systems or what I'm about to show you, parallax. Would, perhaps parallax, you know, you could have some uses, of course, in, in applications, but it would depend. But what parallax does is another node. Everything's a node. Everything's high level in Coco Sharp, and it allows you to move the sprites that you're putting on the screen, and, and other things too, like you can do a particle system with it and so on. Usually sprites, though, at different ratios to each other. So when I'd, I'd move the parallax node, I'd set the ratio of movement from one node that's a child of that parallax node to another node, another sprite that's a child of it, and I'd say move this half as much as you move that. And then when they move, they move at a different rate relative to each other. So what I do here, this is an old example again in Gone Bananas, you'll notice the clouds up on the top, You'll see when the monkey moves down, I move them relative to the monkey, and the cloud on the left moved twice as much up and down as the cloud on the right. Now, I didn't move the clouds at all. I moved the, the parallax node. The parallax node has the clouds added to them, and then all I do is I just set a ratio between the two. Right? So I add these as a child to the parallax node, and then I move the parallax node, and everything within it moves relatively. This isn't the kind of parallax where you like infinitely scroll and things would just keep moving. That you have to roll yourself. This is sort of the back and forth kind of parallax like you might see in a game like Angry Birds or you could, you've seen in maybe applications where people have an image and you, know, you scroll it down and the data moves and the image maybe moves a little more in the background. I think they even have that in the Xamarin Forms conference app if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in the speakers. So it could have some use in there. I think though that part of it though, if that's all I was looking to get from it, it might just be easier to do without 
uh, just, just to go straight into forms and just roll it directly inside of um, um, Xamarin Forms. But you know, it's available in here, so just so you know about it. Certainly it's cool in games, kind of the back and forth thing. And then there's effects. Effects are great. They're, they're implemented, there's a whole bunch of them. Again, you can see like the, the, this waving feature here. Um, if you get the, the, the sample, the, the project templates, the gallery project template to create a new Coco Sharp gallery project, I think it's called. Um, it doesn't have those images, those are a couple I replaced it, but it's got a couple of the monkeys, and they, it, it's basically that code, and it will show you how to set these things up. It's so easy though, there's not much to see. They're implemented as actions. So the way, you, the way I, I say move this sprite to this position, or jump by this position, is the exact same way that I would, I would add effects, advanced, like really intricate visual effects, and there's a whole bunch. Um, but they're very easy to work with. They're implemented as actions, and they're added just like actions to the node. And then there's a whole bunch more. You could go on for a long time about all the things that are in this guy. There's the monogame content pipeline, which you know it sits on top of monogame. It could take advantage of that. And I know Dean may not be here, but that works at Xamarin, worked real hard on that. There's audio support, both for playing little audio sound effects and playing music. The whole audio engine that they revamped in the latest version of the last couple versions. Tile map support, texture caching, um, which you get for free, partially under the covers, and you can use directly. Animated transitions between scenes, and you name it. So a whole bunch of stuff. Let me show you a demo here that I've got. Let's run it, and I'll show you what it does. A simple example, and so I have a form. You know, this is a, a, a Xamarin Forms application. I didn't do much forms with it except for the page, and then I contained the Coco Sharp part within there. Just run that in the simulator and see we got them from my from the slide. The monkeys are laid out in a circle. So there's a custom layout, right? And I could have forms, I could have data up on the top, I could have a list, I could have stack views, I, I could have all that kind of stuff, right? But in the middle of it, I've got the Xamarin forms, you know, the Coco Sharp view, and another Xamarin forms view that inside of there allows me to do pretty interesting things. Like I can have this layout, great. I could technically make a custom layout in Xamarin Forms and achieve that, but it might be a little hard. Well, maybe I could do that too, but I could animate the layout from the layout perspective and rotate them around. I could change the angle and I could just make it a selector. I could change the scale as I did it and I could have a, a cover flow kind of effect if anyone wanted to still do that. And at all the same time while it's animating, I've got this you know, particle system in the middle just to save time. I also got the Android one in here, 100% of the same code. Oh, sorry, let me just, uh, I got it in here in the simulator or the emulator. In the emulator, in the emulator. Okay. Uh, loading in my emulator. Okay, hang on a second, let me just run it. And I'll set a startup project. Droid, it's Marshmallow. I'll let this guy load. I'm being real daring, trying to run the Android thing. I usually skip. Oh good, so it loaded. Maybe I left, I left it open before, I don't know what happened. So same exact code, I could rotate it and I got the particle system in the middle, 100% code share, and I can do that waving thing, I can do all kinds of stuff. The last thing I wanna show, so I'll make this code available, it's a real simple example, it shows how to add sprites, it shows how to add the particle system, it shows how to apply actions, and it shows how to do a, a custom layout, the layout's kind of custom code, there's nothing kind of built in, and it shows how to animate that. And maybe more importantly, it also shows how to hook it into forms, and shows the bootstrapping code with the Coco Sharp view, and that event, you know, the load game, I called it load game, but it's the view created that you have to handle, where you do the delegate, um, the old delegate type of stuff that they had in CC application delegate, setting up the loading, the proper content, and loading the game initially. 100% of that code is reused now, though. That's, that's kind of cool to me, that I don't have to even touch the native platform thing, except for to add the, the content, right? The images and, and sounds and whatnot, right? Everything's handled for me. So let me uh, close this. And the last thing I want to show you here, if you go get the Coco Sharp source, which you should do, even though it's packaged up as a NuGet and it's very easy, easy to get. It, you can learn a lot from looking at the source, but in particular within the source is you want this. Even if you don't look at the, app, the platform itself, you want these tests, and they have a project for each platform. You can load up the proper solution. Um, but they're the same tests, and here, I'll run it here and I'll show you. Let's get here. It's a little bit bigger project. So they have a test, these tests are just little concise examples that target the entire API, all the different actions, all the different effects, all these different particle systems, all different kinds of rendering, custom rendering, the drawing, um, audio support, all kinds of things that it has. And they're all available in this application, and the code is there, and it's, you know, there's a little bit of, the, the setup code for some of the tests is a little 
you, don't, you won't care as much about it because it's all about the test part of the tests. But if you get down to the actual test code, then they, turn, they tend to be nice little, almost like little recipes, like little live cookbooks. Um, can almost be put in a workbook or some of these new things they've got. And then, um, in particular, they've got the action tests you can take a look at and see all these actions. And they ported these from the old the Cocos 2D Objective-C one that existed a while ago. Um, these effects tests, I think, are pretty nice. And these show all these different effects you can use. You can see there's some pretty advanced ones. You can see the wave. That one's pretty cool. I remember from the WPF days, they did an example of that. That was like that. So it's like, there's some cool tests, and then there's drawing, and it shows you how to do the CC render texture, which would be interesting to do, you know, the procedural graphics, like I said. Also check out the docs. But you know, so um, they're all there. They're all under the tests folder. You go into the Coco Shark tests, common tests. And I'm not going to go through the code for time's sake here. You guys can look at it just as easily as I can show it to you. And then uh, there's that. Last thing I'll leave you on is the sources. It's all open source. It's actually, Xamarin's been open sourcing like crazy, which is cool, but CocoSharp's been open source for a while. Now that you have CocoSharp on top of Xamarin, Xamarin's free, and Xamarin's open source, you got a pretty good cross-platform open source free solution um, to do games and other things with CocoSharp. That's kind of matured pretty well. Um, so we'll see how it goes in the future. There's a bunch of samples in a separate repo. Um, some of them, your mileage will vary. Some of them are, are not up to 1.7 yet. I know my Gone Bananas one, I gotta, send, I, gotta, I gotta spend a little bit of time. I'm gonna send them a pull request to update that one. They have some newer games that are way better than that one, though. And then the Xamarin Docs, they've done a really good job um, in the last few months getting some tutorials, and, and there's a whole series on Coco Sharp there that's totally up to date, except for that one procedural, kind of advanced article on the procedural graphics, but I think you, could, you guys could grok that and just like update it even yourselves, you know, just, just go through it and you'd get enough from it that you could update it into your own code if you wanted to do that type of thing between that and the tests. Certainly if you have any questions, you can, you can always ping me at Mike Bluestein on Twitter. Um, so yeah, so that's, the, that's my talk here. If anyone has any, we're kind of getting to the end here. I think I'm right at the end. So if anyone has any, we're gonna get going. I know it's the end of the day. People probably wanna go and and get some food and, and get some drinks and all, but I'm gonna hang around outside. If anyone wants to talk about it or ask any questions, I'll, I'll be around, you know, we can talk all you want. All right, well, thank you.